there is a realm of the spirit that it seems at first look that very few of us are walking in today. Did you know the Holy Spirit is calling us to move deeper into his presence? It seems like, though, in so many services, in so many gatherings, our determination of the things of the Spirit are more dependent upon the experience we have in the physical realm or the emotional realm than what we are receiving from the Spirit. We enter into our churches looking to the pastor to have a word instead of entering into our churches looking at the pastor as a gift given by the Lord and anointed by the Spirit in a vessel through which the Spirit will speak to us. Yes, they will prepare messages. Yes, in programs such as this one, we will prepare messages. But it is the Spirit speaking through us into the ear of your spirit that brings revelation knowledge. You need to understand, friend, as we get started today, that we have become too dependent upon our outer ear, upon our emotional realm. The soul consists of our mind, will, intellect, and emotions. Our physical being consists of our five physical senses. But as, spirit, as Christians, we are born-again Christians called to operate from the Spirit. I'm Mark Baker, and in today's broadcast, we're going to continue talking about the subject, the language of the Spirit. And we have been talking about, specifically, the gift of tongues. We've looked at the early church and saw that when they had got to the point where You know, they were just becoming too busy administering the church. They appointed six deacons, seven deacons to take over the church and the administration. One of these was Stephen, and we looked at him in the previous broadcast. I want to go back and look at him again today. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, it says, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there rose of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. But I want you to notice specifically in verse 10, it says they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Stephen, it says in Acts chapter 6, in verse 5, it says, And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they so chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Now, when you look at Stephen, he was a man who understood the things of the Spirit. He was speaking from a level of revelation that the people who heard him could not dispute, and it stirred up anger within them. They could not receive because they were living from the realm of reason, which is the realm of the soul. You see, friends, we are called to be operating from the Spirit. I believe the early church understood this. I believe that we do not understand the things of the Spirit, because we do not understand the language of the Spirit. I want to go back and look at something the Holy Spirit spoke to us in a recent broadcast that aired on 731. Notice what the Spirit of God said. He says, There was a grasp on revelation knowledge in the early church, knowledge that has been largely lost today. We seek to please, we aim to entertain. We rush through the message to make room for the entertainment. It is revelation released from the Spirit that brings forth the manifestation of power. But far too often we lean upon our soul. Our messengers are filled with reason, reason drawn from the soul. For the soul exercised in the natural realm is a soul not yielded to the spiritual. Too often we look to our reasoning 
We look to our naturally acquired knowledge. We look externally to hear what this one said or that one said. But how often do we look within to find what the Spirit said? For did not Paul say that the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be with us all, not a select few? For he longs to fellowship, he longs to teach. We see in John 14, 26 that Jesus told us he came to teach us and to show us things to come. Far too many within the church are surprised by the events of this world. We have the one who lives outside of time. He can see ahead, he can see behind, and he can see where we're at today. We look to him, we learn his ways. We learn to listen, we learn to follow. He will show us the way to go, and with him we will grow. We have been given a language, and as we yield our tongues, we exercise ourselves in the Spirit, and as, with that exercise, our ability to receive grows. For we expand our inner man, and our inner man is just like a container. As that container grows, the revelation received will also continue to grow. For there is a wisdom not of this world. This was the wisdom in which Stephen walked. This was the we wisdom in which he talked. They heard, but they could not understand. They heard, but they could not dispute. We talk about apologetics. We learn natural ways to respond. But what about those who are trained in the ways of the Spirit by the Spirit himself? Those such as the Ephesian believers that Paul took aside to the school of Tyrannus to spend a year immersed in the ways in the things of the Spirit. Where are those who train and disciple in the way they did in the early church? For Stephen walked and learned by following those who had come before him. His elders walked in the ways of the Spirit. He watched and learned, and he too began to walk in that same way. This is the path of discipleship that is so often not followed. For we lead people through a prayer but do we show them how to become immersed? Do we show them the ways of the Spirit? Not only through our words, but through demonstration. For if we are not walking in these realms, we cannot lead others. The time is short. The time is at an end. The Father shall soon give the word, and we shall be called home. But will the plan be fulfilled? For it is in our disobedience to answer the call of the Spirit that the plan is not further along. There are many who have been reached, but few who have been touched with the deep things of the Spirit. The power in which the early church, the power in which the Master walked, is the power that we too should be walking today. We have those that we have elevated. We have those who we've given status to. But in the early church... It was those who walked in the things of the Spirit that saw the power flow, not those who had been given an office or a status by man, but those who had been elevated by the Spirit. For Paul stepped away for three years to be alone with him. Paul received the revelation that became the, gospel, the New Testament message. Paul received that alone with the Spirit, praying in the language of the Spirit, he learned the ways of the Spirit. Will we follow the path of Paul, or will we follow the path of man? Studying, learning, and acquiring things to satisfy our reason. But we are called deeper, friend. We are called to move into the realms of the Spirit. We are called to flow with Him. He longs to have a partnership with us. He longs to lead. He longs to guide. This is the day, this is the time in which we are called to walk. Will we answer the call? Will we follow him? But so busy we are. Will we turn off the news? Will we turn off our sitcoms? Will we turn off our movies and sporting events to pursue him? Or will he continue to be a friendship that we only pursue on the side when we have time? 
for these are dark times. Things are about to change much quicker than any of us can begin to think. Those who are tuned into the realms of the Spirit will be prepared. Will that be you? Will that be me? This is the question the Spirit is asking. So, friend, we see here that Stephen, who, if you go on into verse 7, you'll see he became the first martyr in the church, walked in wisdom and an anointing that they could not re resist. We're not going to go into it for time's sake, but you can go through chapter 7 and see the message that Stephen delivered. I don't believe this was a message he had learned or put together. I don't believe he was preaching from an outline. These were things coming out of his spirit. If we move forward to chapter 8, we'll skip ahead and see another one of these, what we call deacons, Philip. Philip went to Samaria. And it's interesting because Philip's meeting was filled with the power of God. Philip led people to the Lord. But you see an importance on the things of the Spirit from leadership and those who were over Philip and his elders by their reaction to the meeting, which I think is so often different from the reaction we get when we hear lots of people filling out cards and getting baptized and believing in Jesus. And yes, I'm thankful for these things, and I'm thankful when we see converts. But are we leading them beyond salvation into the deeper things of the Spirit? These are the questions we need to ask. Let's look at Philip's ministry here and just kind of see what, the, you know, what we can glean from this. It says, Then Philip, in Acts chapter 8, verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame and were healed, and there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. To whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, this man is the greatest power, great power of God. So Philip came in, he spoke, and I believe he was speaking revelation just as, you know, just as um, Stephen had. They heard what he was speaking, and there were great miracles and signs that followed what he was speaking. Now, if you go back to Mark chapter 16, and look at something here. I believe what Stephen was doing was following the pattern set by the Lord in Mark 16. I believe what Philip was doing was following the pattern set by the Lord in Mark chapter 16. These were the last words of Jesus before ascending to the Father. It says in verse 15, Mark 16, 15, He said unto them, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they the sick shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. What's, what did he confirm? He confirmed the word they preached. Now, if this was just things they had learned or observed and they were just repeating things from their soul, then why aren't we seeing more manifestations today? When Philip went into Samaria, the Lord worked with him and confirmed the message that he preached with signs following. It says, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spoke, seeing and hearing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with him, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. It was just like when Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. If you go back to Luke chapter 4, in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus returned, it's interesting because Jesus 
had been, he was over 30 years old. He had grown up, he had been born of the Spirit from the Virgin Mary, but nobody knew him. I mean, when you think about it, Jesus was just another man anointed by the, you know, walking down the street. People, when he was growing up, he was playing with other kids who had no idea that they were maybe playing a game with their creator. The world was brought into existence with the word of God, and he was the living word. But he laid aside his rights and divinity and grew as a man. He had an advantage because he had been born of the Spirit, and he did not have the sin nature of those around him, but still he was a man. Just like Adam and Eve, he could have sinned if he, if he cho chose to do. It had to be this way in order for him to redeem us. But notice, when he comes back from, his, from the desert temptation, which we see in Luke 4, starting in verse 1, we come to verse 13, it says, when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. So Jesus was relatively, he was unknown, except for those around him. He was not operating in the power and the anointing of the Spirit. He didn't have fame, but then he returns from the desert temptation in the power of the Spirit, and the people took heed of what they were hearing and seeing when he stood up to minister, because he was ministering from the Spirit. This is where I was talking about, friend, that there are realms of the Spirit, which we just don't seem to understand today. There are some people who do, and I'm not saying as a whole, there are pockets but it should be much more known today than it is. When Philip entered into Samaria, it talks about Simon, who was a sorcerer. Simon had been there manifesting probably demonic power, and people had given heed because they were attracted to the power. But then Philip came in speaking words received from the Spirit, speaking forth revelation, and there was a difference the human spirit is tuned to the realms of God. Even the unbeliever has a spirit that gives heed to the realms of God, even if they choose not to act on what their spirits are receiving. There is something about us that is drawn to our Creator. And a person operating under the anointing of the Holy Spirit speaking forth revelation knowledge. And we're going to talk about how we draw forth that revelation knowledge. Stephen entered into his ministry speaking from a position of revelation received from the Spirit of God. Philip entered into his ministry speaking from a position of revelation. Jesus returned from the temptation speaking forth revelation received from the Spirit. All three men caught people's attention. All three men drew people to the message they were delivering. The people were not messy, deliver, you know, necessarily drawn to the men themselves. But the revelation coming forth, the revelation that was being confirmed with signs following, with miraculous demonstrations. This is the message we are called to preach today. This is where God wants us to be. And this is what the Holy Spirit was telling us in this word that was delivered on July 31st. There was a grasp on revelation knowledge in the early church, knowledge that has been lost today. Why is that? And notice what the Spirit of God says. And when he's talking about the messenger, he's talking about teachers, he's talking about pastors, those standing in the message in the ministry. Our messengers are filled with reason. Reason drawn from the soul, for the soul exercised in the natural realm is a soul not yielded to the spirit. The soul exercised in the natural realm is not a soul yielded to the spirit. Friend, you cannot spend the majority of your time on natural things and expect to operate 
in the things of the Spirit. One of the big things about praying in tongues that I'm learning about this language of the Spirit that we have in our spirits, that the Holy Spirit gives us utterance, is it enables us to tune ourselves, just like he's told us in previous messages, to tune ourselves to the realms of the Spirit. And that's where he desires all of us to walk. The Holy Spirit desires to take us deeper, to take us into a deeper place than most of us have ever experienced. But do it to, for us to get there, we're going to have to be willing to set aside time to be spending praying in the Spirit. Now, one problem we have, which I've seen, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I've heard people quote this before and say, well, it says not, not all will speak with tongues. And so if you've ever heard somebody say that, you might be thinking, well, if not everybody's going to speak with tongues, then does that mean not everybody's going to be speaking in Revelation? But let's look at what exactly was said there, because this is often said. I, I remember hearing professors when I was in Bible college use this verse to say that the Pentecostals were wrong in saying this was for everybody. But notice exactly the context here, because when you're studying Scripture, you need to look at Scripture, and you need to understand what Scripture is actually saying. It says, in, starting in verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all pr prophets, are all teachers, are all workers in miracles? Have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? but covered earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show it to you in a more excellent way. And then he goes into verse 13 where he talks about love, because love is the foundation for all ministry. But when you look in context, he is talking about ministry gifts, and he's talking about public ministry. He is not talking about our private prayer language. We'll all speak in tongues. No, not every spirit-baptized believer will speak in tongues in a public assembly. But every spirit-baptized believer can speak with tongues in their private prayer life. If you go down to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 13, we've already looked at this previously, or I apologize, verse 18. It says, I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than you all. This is Paul speaking. Paul is correcting the Corinthians for their excess in public assemblies. In the midst of his correction, he tells them that he thanks his God that he spoke in tongues more than them all. You see, he recognized that in a public assembly, it was not always proper, and that's where it's important to be led by the Spirit of God. I believe that Paul did most of his speaking in private, just as you and I should do our speaking in private. But one problem people have when we start talking about this, is they think the Holy Spirit's speaking through them. When you speak in tongues, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, it says that the, they spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. The word utterance in the Greek is, could be more properly translated inspiration. He inspired them, but they had to open their mouths to speak. Just as when I'm sitting here in front of the camera teaching you, the Holy Spirit's giving me utterance. He's giving me inspiration. And I am speaking from that place of inspiration, from utterance to release the teaching message. But he is not speaking through me. He is anointing me. He is inspiring me. He is giving me utterance. So I open my mouth and begin to teach. In the same sense, when you pray in the Spirit or pray in tongues, he gives you utterance. He gives you inspiration and you open your mouth and begin to speak. But it is not him doing the speaking, friend. It is you doing the speaking as you yield to him. Paul said that he thanked God that he spoke in tongues more than the all. With Stephen, it said he was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We're going to see as we move forward, faith comes from within. Faith is activated from the realms of the Spirit. Therefore, if we're not in tune with the realms of the Spirit, we will not be in tune 
with the measure of faith that God has placed within us. In Romans chapter 12, 3, we see that he has given to every man the measure of faith. Now, God is a spirit. We see this in John chapter 4, verse 24, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Our relationship with God is spirit to spirit. He did not place that measure of faith in our soul, and he did not place that measure of faith in our physical body, which means that that measure of faith is in our spirit. But it is up to us to tune ourselves to the spirit. What has the Holy Spirit been telling us about tuning ourselves to the spirit? We pray in tongues to do so. Now, just as a form of introduction, which we'll pick up in the next broadcast, in 2 Peter chapter 3, I want to read something that Peter says, and then we'll close out for today and pick this up tomorrow. In verse 15, it says, in chapter 3 of verse 15 of 2 Peter, an account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you, also in all his apostles, speaking in them these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. The wisdom Paul walked in sounds just like what Peter, what Philip and Stephen delivered. Things that were hard to be understood from the reason. How did Paul receive that wisdom? I believe it was by speaking in tongues, and we're going to pick up here in the next program. But for now, friend, we are out of time. And as we close out, let me remind you once again that you can live your life to the fullest, walking by the faith of the Son of God.